I'm going to review a little bit more about imperialism because I feel like we moved through it really fast. So um, I'm going to talk about, again, what were the causes, Spanish-American War, and then move through our presidents, Roosevelt, Taft, and McKinley, um, and also Wilson, who are imperialists. So why did we join the Imperialist Club? We talked about business. Businesses wanting to get new resources, new markets to sell to. Um, so we're going to see trade increase in America. Um, military reasons, we needed coaling stations. We also needed to get um, to protect our new interest around the globe. We, have saw, we talked about in the Gilded Age, social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is going to come in again. And white man's burden that we need to go into these areas. And we kind of saw this in those documents, those overtones. Um, we saw religious missionary zeal that we needed to go in, teach the heathen religion, save them from their idols. And then the last thing is that manifest destiny is over. We're not trying to conquer these areas and make them states, but they're territories that will give us resources. So the first area we're really going to is Hawaii. Um, and this is under the Cleveland administration that we have a lot of U.S. missionaries going into Hawaii to bring in religion to the heathen that they feel that they need. Um, and we see that many Americans are out here and they're planting on the sugar plantations. And um, there is going to be a coup. And Queen Liliuokalani will be overtaken by the American planters and the Marines that are stationed in Hawaii. And so I just want you to look at the depiction. Again, we've, we've depicted her as a heathen here. But this is really how Queen Liliuokalani looks. She is a refined, civilized woman. And uh, we see when the U.S. tries to go in, uh, they are, Americans are really upset because we used to have this treaty called the Reciprocatory Treaty that allowed for U.S. citizens that were in Hawaii to trade with the U.S. without taxes on them. But then the McKinley tariff comes in and that group of planters that have been exempt from the tariff now has to pay the tariff that they get upset. Their goods are going to be more expensive. Americans won't want to buy their sugar their and their fruits. And so this is when the Americans, the American businessmen rile up because they're upset about this tax and they have an uprising against Queen Lilukulani. And they're able to control. And then they seek they seek statehood under Cleveland's administration. He's not allowed in. And so this is why Sanford Ballard Dole comes in and says, okay, we can't get annexed to the United States. We'll create our own republic. And he becomes a president of Hawaii. Eventually, under the McKinley administration, Hawaii will be annexed. So this is Hawaii being annexed under the McKinley administration. So let's look at Japan. Uh, we see that the U.S. opens up relations with Japan in 1853 with Commodore Matthew Perry. We saw him last semester, but I'm bringing him up this semester because it goes more with imperialism. And we see that the Japanese and the Chinese had closed their borders. And you should have learned that in world history last year, that they close it off to foreigners. And us trying to get into Japan is us trying to get into China as well. And so this is going to lead to the Treaty of Kana Owaga. I don't know how to say that, but it basically opens up trade between the U.S. and Japan. And um, we're going to have some issues. By 1900, we're going to see the Japanese um, agree in the Gentlemen's Agreement to stop sending over laborers to the United States. We've already banned the Chinese. And now um, in California, many people are looking at the immigrants as lowering wages. Um, and we're going to see that they want to get rid of those workers. And um, the U.S. will come to an agreement. And we see that we will recognize the immigrants who are here, who are currently in, in the United States. Um, but we will also have issues because in San Franciscan schools, San Francisco schools, they were discriminating uh, Japanese kids um, into separate schools. So the U.S. government says, okay, uh, we will stop segregating Asians into separate schools, but you have to stop the, 
the influx of immigrants coming into America. And so that's what's agreed in the gentleman's agreement. We'll stop the laborers from Japan coming to the U.S. and we'll stop the discrimination that is happening to the Asian people in the San Francisco school system. And the last agreement is the Root Takahira, which agrees to trade and we agree to respect each other's territory in the Pacific. That treaty will go out by World War II. Um, we see Henry Cabot Lodge. He's going to be a senator and he is going to encourage us getting involved globally in other empires. And so um, he says we, we, we have to take a more active role in our hemisphere. And this is what's going to encourage us to get involved in a couple of places. The first place is Alaska. We see this, we saw this after the Civil War that we obtained Alaska, and many people made fun of Seward for taking this over from the Russians and offering 7.2 million. Many people said this was just an ice box. So here's our little ice box. But eventually, what we realized what we'll find is gold and silver. And so in 1900, after the 1896 election, we don't have a massive panic because we find gold and that comes into our money supply and we're able to prevent another depression. So we've talked about Cuba, why we get involved. We see this is imperialist tendencies. We saw this political cartoon. We saw this. Um, we saw the, the concentration camps that made us feel sympathetic. We also saw the journalists who were evoking our emotions to get involved in this war. The DeLome letter, which made fun of our president as having a uh, not having a backbone. We also saw Roosevelt getting involved and he left his position as the Secretary of Navy. And we're seeing that um, he even criticizes McKinley of having a backbone of a chocolate and Claire, that we need to go fight to protect Cuba because, you know, they're, they're a nation like America. They, they, they're trying to overthrow an oppressive motherland. We've talked about Roosevelt getting involved with the Rough Riders. And then our military being poorly prepared because this is a bad artistic rendering because we know they didn't have horses. Um, we're going to see that we get involved. Another reason is because the main explosion, many people believe it was Spain, but what we find out from the um, report later, it was actually internal combustion in the magazine rack. And so it's a quick little war in a year. We, we block um, Cuba, which prevents the Spanish from coming in. We see um, the U.S. wasn't prepared for this war. We sent our military with winter fatigues. We don't have the horses there. We know that the battle happens in the Philippines, that Commodore Dewey goes down there and he meets Melia Aguilando and his men. And their whole thing is to capture Manila, but they don't capture it till the day after the treaty is signed. And so this really leads to McKinley um, and our debate, should we annex or not annex the Philippines? And y'all read the documents, we do annex the Philippines. And so if you look at the background of this political cartoon, this is Napoleon and Caesar. They're equating him to being a dictator because these people wanted freedom. And we saw that from Emilio Aguilando's letter. Here's Emilio Aguilando. We see that um, the U.S. at this time feels that we cannot leave the Philippines to themselves. They need to know civilization. Um, they could be taken over by another part, group of people. So we do take them over. And by July 4th, 1946, they do have um, independence. But amidst that time, they're actually taken over by Japan. We see William Howard Taft come in and be an administrator in the Philippines. And we see the U.S. after the Spanish-American War. Now we have a sphere of influence. We have colonies. And the Treaty of Paris is what gives us Puerto Rico and Guam. They would become territories. We pay $20 million for the Philippines, and this is one reason why we don't want to let them go. We've paid so much money for them. We become an imperial power. And this leads to a rising of people saying, look, why are we going to other nations and spreading and spending money and trying to teach them democracy when we have issues here at home. So people like Marchane Carnegie, William Jennings Bryan, William James become leaders of the Anti-Imperialist League saying let's invest in America and not in abroad. And they campaign against the annexation of the Philippines. And we talked about the Cuba. We tried to increase sanitation because more people died of mosquitoes than of bullets. We go in and clean up the cesspools. We establish roads. We establish uh, government entities for them. And it really upsets the Cubans that this will lead to the Platt Amendment. We agree that we're going to remove our troops from Cuba. 
but we fear that it could be taken over. So they have to allow the U.S. to intervene in their affairs. So really, Cuba is not independent. They have to give us a military base, Guantanamo Bay, and they cannot build up debt. So the Platt Amendment really makes Cuba a protectorate. So we got to look at Puerto Rico because this is a new place we require. And in the Foreigner Act, Puerto Rico becomes an unincorporated territory. The when it means an unincorporated territory is that they're citizens of Puerto Rico, not the, of the U.S. Eventually, this is going to lead to um, import duties being placed on their goods. This will lead to some cases going before the Supreme Court called the Insular Cases. If the U.S. controls a territory, do constitutional rights go to it? And the Supreme Court says it's not a guarantee. Congress, according by the Northwest Ordinance, has the power to decide if these territories get rights because they could be a territory and then they could be a state. So Congress has the full authority to determine if the people have rights. And they're going to remove the tariffs on the Florida Act. Eventually, this will lead to the Jones Act, which will give full territorial status to Puerto Rico. So by doing this, Puerto Ricans are now full citizens. It will remove the tariffs. They, yes, they're full citizens. They get to elect their own legislator, their government, but they can't vote on the presidency because they're not fully a state. They're citizens of America, but they still have their own government. And so this has come up in several elections. Can Puerto Ricans vote in the presidency? If they become a state, if they become the 51st state, they can because they have over 60,000 inhabitants. They could become the 51st state. And they get to send a representative to the House. So this basically sets up what we have for Puerto Rico today. So because we've gained territories, uh, many of people start to realize these territories are in the Pacific. We need to get to them quickly. And so the, the, um, the champions for a canal come up. We've tried to build a canal in Nicaragua, but we had to avoid that. Remember Nicaragua, we talked about it in the 1850s of trying to make the 16th slave state, but we couldn't at this time, and then we go to Cuba. But many people start looking at Panama. And I already talked about the Clayton Bueller Treaty. It was this whole thing that we were trying to build a canal in Nicaragua. The English were trying to do it. England was trying to do it, and we both decided not to do it. Um, but the French have been trying to build a pan of the Panama Canal and they, they haven't been able to do it. And so this will lead to the US trying to come in and negotiate a treaty to be able to get this done. We try to um, get the Colombian government to allow, because Panama at this time belongs to um, Colombia, and we try to negotiate a treaty and the Colombian government does not allow us. And so this will lead to the Hay Pence Ford Treaty that we basically encourage Panama to revolt and we will help them militarily to gain their independence. And um, Philip Braun Viral is are gonna be our agent that helps us in this whole matter. And we will eventually get Panama to revolt against Colombia. Our military will go down there, prevent the Colombian military from coming over. Panama gains its independence and grants us use of the canal. And so this canal will be created in the Isthmus of Panama. And basically, this is a mountainous area. And so the U.S. is going to have to come in and bring in our, come on, Theodore Roosevelt, come out, where are you? Um, bring in our construction crews to basically create a, a, a canal. They're going to create a huge river. And um, this will allow for ships to come in and out of this canal and basically cut down the travel time around South America. And so let me show you this video. I have this video. Sorry, guys. I'm going to I want to show you this video of how the canal was built. I don't know if y'all want the music on, but it's very suspenseful. There's no such thing Sorry as a for the commercial. Perfect writer. This is why I use Grammarly to check my work. If I'm putting commas in my... Right, this is a time lapse. It takes about a whole day to go through the canal. So just pay attention. And I'm going to talk about how this canal was built by us looking through the video. So this is coming in from the Atlantic Ocean. And right here... There's two tr 
tracks. Y'all see that door that just opened? Okay. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna basically carve out this little canal area. Do y'all see the difference in the water? The water here is really low and it's really high over here. This is what the French could not figure out. How to be able to get the water to stay so the boats could pass through. So the US is gonna use the Army Corps of Engineers and what they're gonna, what, what they're gonna do is they're gonna build this lock system. It's these doors and underneath these doors are gonna be pipelines. And the pipeline is gonna bring the water that's higher over here to this side to make the boat level out so it could go through. So you're gonna see this. Do you see how the water just rose and the water came down on this side? That's what the pipe's doing underneath. It's leveling out the water. Once the water is leveled out, the doors will open and the boat will go through. Okay, same process here. Do you see how the water's lower here and then higher on that side? The pipelines underneath are gonna open up. The water will decline on this side and increase on this side. It will level out, the doors will open, and then it will go through. Same thing again. And again, this is a time lapse, so it's going really, really fast, and it looks like they're gonna bump into the mountains. Don't freak out, the boat's going really slow. Look at all this area. All of this area had to be carved out and flooded. And so this is why it's gonna take 10 years to build the Panama Canal. So it's gonna to get to the Pacific side really soon. And it's gonna do everything we saw on the Atlantic side, but in the opposite. So all of these mountains had to be carved out. So now the water's higher and it's lower on the other end. What's gonna happen is the, the locks open underneath and it evens out, they go through the doors. Okay, so now it's getting to the Pacific Ocean. That took about a whole day. Um, if y'all wanna watch it again, y'all can ask Ms. Morgan later. I know it's exciting to see. Um, if you ever want to, there is a whole cruise that goes through this Panama Canal. So it takes, it took about 10 years to build this. It took about 10 years. A lot of it stemmed from digging out that mountaintop. Also, because we were dealing with so much water, they had to eradicate the mosquito here. That's why Walter Reed comes in. And then they had to build this huge lake to be able to flood the canal area. So Roosevelt is taking in a very active role. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna add on to the Monroe Doctrine. He's gonna say chronic wrongdoing in the Western Hemisphere may in America as elsewhere ultimately require some intervention by some civilized nation in the Western Hemisphere. So someone has to step up when someone is intervening that's doing wrong. He says, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. will follow the Ramon Doctrine. It will, and however reluctant, we, we don't really want to do it, but we're going to have to. In flagrant cases, in wrongdoing or impotence, we will exercise a power. Of, we will exercise of an international police power. The U.S. will become a police officer in this hemisphere. So hence, why you see Roosevelt over here? with his Monroe Doctrine preventing the English from coming over and taking Santa Domingo. So Roosevelt is known for this adage of speaking softly but carrying a big stick. So you see this big stick right here. It is gonna be in reference to the military that the US will go around the Western Hemisphere and protect it. We have to talk about our issues with China. We know that we have banned the Chinese. And so um, we there's a lot of stereotypes about the Chinese. Um, so if you ever see this bat baby, um, you see how he's chained up. Many American businessmen are upset because they like the Asians coming to work for them, specifically the Chinese, because they work for less. And um, this will lead to the Chinese Exclusion Act, hence the, do y'all see the, the little fence we built to prevent them from coming in? 
But this is going to lead to the U.S. wanting to get involved in trade with China. And the Chinese have expelled a lot of foreigners. And this is going to lead to the Boxer Rebellion, where um, the Americans and other Europeans are attacked by the Asians because they feel that they're not being respected. And this will lead to the U.S. trying to get the open door policy because the spheres of influence are not being respected. Do y'all see these Europeans are just cutting and carving up China without the respect to the people? So John Hay will negotiate a treaty saying that we need to guarantee um, the Chinese protection to allow them to trade. And so the open door policy basically puts China, if y'all look at this little political cartoon, puts China in control of who they let into their nation, but they have to respect it. And the open door policy is kind of selfish in the U.S. behalf because if we look at the spheres of influence right here, the U.S. was not even included in it. By doing the open door policy, the U.S. will be able to have an active role in trading with China. So the U.S. is coming on in with our trade. So the Amer America will become a, a huge world power and will have a lot of military and coaling stations in the Pacific. But we start to see ourselves as a, a society that we need to bring democracy. We need to bring Christianity. We feel white men's burden. So if you can see all of our, our little brethren, Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, um, the Dominican Republic, that we are getting on our soapbox and teaching them about democracy and religion. We see Roosevelt acting like a policeman here with his Monroe Doctrine. One of the things that he's going to do is he's actually going to prevent war from between Japan and Russia. And this, he gets a Nobel Peace Prize for preventing this war because they were both trying to covet, um, remember those islands, the Shalak, the Shakilan Islands that you had on your map? Um, he pre prevented war, both of them trying to obtain that land. At the same time, Roosevelt realizes that we need to modernize our military, so he sends the Great White Fleet out. And um, it's to show our power. And he sends them to many Asian countries so they could realize that the U.S. is a powerful force. Taft is going to get involved in foreign policy because he realizes a lot of businesses have gone overseas. And many of these um, natives in their lands are upset about the U.S. coming in and taking their stuff. So he's going to allow for the military to go in and protect private industry. And Taft's dollar diplomacy says the U.S. should create stability using the military abroad to promote commercial interest. So our next issue actually deals with Wilson in Mexico. We are seeing that in 1910, the Mexicans are really upset. They're upset about American businesses controlling their railroads, controlling their mines, controlling the oil, controlling their banks. And so um, revolutionaries are going to try to seize power. Huerta seizes power, and he puts Madero, the old president, in prison. Madero had been pro-American and allowing businesses to do as they please. And this is going to lead to other revolutionaries such as Carranza, Pancho Villa, Emilio Zapato, Obregón, and Huerta fighting against who should obtain power. The U.S. is going to get involved because they realize, well, if revolutionaries take over, our American businessmen are going to lose out. Lose out. So troops come in to Veracruz. And we see eventually a new guy come to power, Carranza. Here are all of our revolutionaries. You won't need to know these guys. Just know that the revolutionaries put threats and we fear that the American businessmen are going to be attacked. But what will happen is amidst all of this, World War I will break out and the U.S. will pull out of Mexico. So Wilson's policy is the U.S., we need to be a teacher. So hence why Wilson is teaching. He says, if we teach our Latin American brethren democracy, they will be able to govern and there will be no reason for revolution. And a lot of this stems from what he's seeing in Mexico, the revolutions. And if they had democratic principles, they would not attack U.S. businessmen. And so he believes in spreading democracy and promoting peace. Okay, so these are the Bandinos that General John Bay perishing will eventually try to take down, but we stop because the war breaks out. So the U.S. is going to have more global investments. Um, we get involved in more, um, we get involved a lot in Latin America. Okay, so we're going to intervene several times in Latin America. And all of a sudden, if you look at this in hemispheres, 
the US is in control of a lot of chips, right? We're the dominant one in the Western Hemisphere. However, if we look at the Eastern Hemisphere, all of the Europeans are fighting over these little chips. And so this leads to the US being the dominant one and eventually the US trying to stay out of World War I, which I'll get us into this week. Oops, sorry guys, that was not a, a that was just me hitting the camera. <laughs> 